Okay, sorry, part two. The camera I'm using has a 30 minute time limit. I, I know, but it's the a, it's a camera I've got. So uh, if you're still watching this, I am really sorry about part one. Boy, was that, I just got rambling and rambling and rambling. S sorry, that was, that was a complete waste of time, wasn't it? Okay, so what I had initially thought I would do is I would kind of intermix the factual information with kind of some of uh, the stories of people I talked to in Japan, some of the conversations I had. Uh, I know I was talking about that in part one, but I didn't get to half of kind of the interesting conversations I had in Japan about this topic. But um, after finishing part one and realizing that I just kind of rambled and I uh, didn't get to a lot of interesting information, I'm going to reevaluate my strategy here. I'm not going to talk about how I learned this. I'm not going to talk about who I talked to or whatever. I'm just going to talk about the subject itself. See if perhaps I can save this topic in the second video and just uh, put out, put as much kind of information out as I can. Uh, just based on kind of all the stuff I've learned over the years. So this, is, uh, this has been a pet interest of mine for a long time, but uh, as you can see, I'm just talking extemporaneously, no notes. No, that's a lie, I do have some notes here. But like, uh, this isn't a research paper, so if I get something wrong or something, just let me know in the comments. I might mess up on a, on a few dates or names or something. Okay, so uh, the Japanese student movement in the 1960s Kind of happened in two major waves. The first wave was right at right 1960, like right at the beginning of the decade. And then the second wave was the end of the 60s, you know, the 67, 68, 69, the, which coincided with the global student movement. Uh, talk about the first wave first. Now, in order to talk about what happened in 1960, I'm going to need to back up a little bit here because there were some politics in play. Uh, I guess the first thing to understand is that after World War II, there was a significant portion of Japan's population which wanted to embrace a pacifist constitution. So there's Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution, which says there's a, Japan is not allowed to engage in war. This was uh, sort of imposed during the American occupation. Um, but it was something that the Japanese government had collaborated with the Americans in making. And it's something that the Japanese really took ownership of. Uh, it's not true of every single last Japanese person, but kind of broadly speaking as a whole, there's a very strong pacifist element in Japan. Uh, the way my professor at university put it, he said, they want to become the Switzerland of Asia you know, kind of the neutral country in Asia that's not involved in any wars, but it's kind of like arbitrating between all the wars. Um, and there was always a tension in Japan because uh, there's a significant portion of Japan that wants to be pacifist, but during the Cold War, American bases were on Japan. So Japan was part of the Cold War. Uh, and there was, there was a number of things going on. In 1959, uh, there was a U.S. spy plane, uh, Gary Powers. He was shot down over the Soviet Union. Uh, and he had actually launched from Japan. So when the Soviet Union said, hey, you know, we shot down your spy plane. You, you send any more spy planes over here, we're going to retaliate. Japan was worried they were going to retaliate to Japan. Uh, there was also huge U.S. bases on Japan, uh, particularly in Okinawa, but even in other parts of Japan. There, there are still to this day. And the U.S. had a security treaty with Japan that allowed them to keep their bases there. Now, when this treaty was up for renewal in 1960, there was a big element of Japan which had, didn't want to be involved in the U.S. wars and wanted just to be pacifist. So uh, that was opposition to kind of the security treaty with the U.S. was a big cause of the student protests in the 1960s. 
The second one has to do with kind of the old fascists coming back into power. So what happened in Japan, and this happened in Western Germany as well, but let's not talk about Western Germany, that's going to complicate it. Let's just talk about Japan. What happened in Japan, when the U.S. occupied Japan after the war, kind of the first thing they did was they kind of opened up the prisons and they kind of let out all the people that the fascists had put in jail. You know, the communists, the socialists, the labor leaders. Uh, but then China went communist in 1949. And there was a big fear that communism would spread towards Japan. So then the U.S. government completely reversed policy on this. And so instead of letting the communists and the labor leaders out of jail, they started kind of putting the communists and the labor leaders back into jail. And they wanted in the government kind of strong anti-communists. Well, who were the strong anti-communists? The old fascists that we just got done fighting in World War II. But, you know, it, it's a Cold War now, so it's kind of anti anti-communist priorities. So uh, there was a guy who his name, what, what is it? Kishi Nobusuke Kishi, I wrote it down. Uh, he had been uh, a suspected class A war criminal uh, after World War II, kind of during the Tokyo trials when these guys were all on trial. I think he was part of a list of people who we just never got around to trying because we just kind of ran out of time and resources. Uh, he had been a uh, deputy of munitions, I think, under the Tojo government. Anyways, he was, he, was, he was one of the old guard fascists. And kind of under this kind of rehabilitation for the old guard, uh, he had been, uh, he, he became prime minister. Um, now the left just kind of lost their mind here. Um, Again, I said I wasn't going to get into this, but an interesting parallel with West Germany. In West Germany, the same thing happened. Under the name of anti-communism, a number of those fascists kind of came back into power in the 50s and 60s. And the student left in West Germany kind of lost their mind about this. There was a paranoia in both Japan and Germany. Uh, among the kind of students that the, the fascists were coming back into power and it was the end of the world and we've got to do something to stop them now or it's going to be the fascist days all over again. So I think the student movement in West Germany is very fascinating for uh, similar reasons. It got very kind of intense very quickly because of that paranoia. Uh, I think the same thing was happening in Japan. That kind of intense paranoia kind of fueled a lot of the energy behind these protests. So 1960 was uh, the renewal with the U.S. Security Treaty. President Eisenhower was supposed to fly into Japan to sign the treaty. Uh, and the students had a student federation, which was... I forget the whole name of it. It was something like Zen Kyoto something something something. It gets abbreviated as Zengakuren, which in Japan is kind of the all student federation. Uh, and they came out in huge numbers with uh, kind of hard hats and, and, and uh, poles and staffs and just kind of fought the police and kind of smashed into the diet compound and uh, was just such huge protests that the Japanese government had to cancel Eisenhower's trip. It was a huge embarrassment to the government because they couldn't guarantee Eisenhower's safety. I think if I remember right, the students were able to smash their way all, all the way into the Japanese parliament before they got cleared out of there. They did not succeed in stopping the treaty. The treaty was still renewed with the US, but it was a huge thing. Uh, and that was kind of the first wave of the student protests. Now, people have kind of forgotten this. Uh, well, in America especially, we've kind of forgotten this. This has been kind of lost from the history books. But at the time, this was a big deal. So uh, there was a guy named C. Wright Mills who wrote a letter to the New Left. I think it came out in 1960. It was... If, if you're into this kind of history of the New Left, this is kind of one of the, the supposedly founding documents of the New Left. And in there, he says in the, in the letter, it's a long letter, so he says a bunch of stuff. But among other stuff, he says, hey, you know, 
I know you students in Britain and in America, you're depressed, you think change can't happen. But look at what happened in Japan. He said, that's kind of your inspiration. I think he used Japan and also maybe South Korea. There, this, there was a big student protest in South Korea at around the same time, uh, somewhat different reasons. I don't have time to talk about South Korea, and besides, I don't really know much about it anyway. So that's another topic for somebody else to cover. Um, again, I mentioned this before in part one, but uh, Clark Kerr, who was the, the head of Berkeley during the free speech movement, kind of blamed the whole thing on Japan. Uh, he said, it was inevitable that this would eventually come given the civil rights movement and given what was happening in Japan. So people kind of, you know, in, in the U.S. and I guess globally thought this was a big deal at the time and it was at the time perceived to have a kind of global impact on the student movements. Now, you don't really hear much about the Japanese student movement again until about 1967 or 1968, although... Uh, I, my grandfather, this is a little bit of a digression, he saved Life magazines all throughout his life. Uh, like, he had a lifetime subscription to Life magazine, and he just saved them all. And I was going through them one afternoon, and I think it was uh, 1964 or 1965, just kind of in the mid-60s, there was a profile of the student protests in Japan, which kind of indicated to me that something something kept going throughout the mid-60s, even though it didn't kind of flare up big again until about 67, 68. There was an element of the, the protest kind of going on throughout, and I think it was kind of similar concerns. They didn't, the, the left didn't want to be part of the U.S. Uh, military bases and kind of a pacifist concern. Okay, so then, what happened near the end of the 60s? Well, for one, this concern about the U.S. being allied with the U.S. military base continued to grow, and the Vietnam War became a very big issue. Uh, now, Japan was, uh, you know, lots of pacifist sentiment, sentiment, but they were linked up with the Vietnam War. The U.S. had bases in Okinawa and in kind of mainland Japan, which acted kind of as a stopping point for soldiers on their way to Vietnam. So, you know, they'd fly into Japan first, kind of the planes would re refuel in Okinawa, and then they'd fly to Vietnam. Uh, also, a lot of Japanese companies were involved in the manufacture of kind of either weapons the U.S. was using in Vietnam or napalm. Uh, and the Japanese left was not happy about this. Uh, as Vietnam War became a bigger news story in the late 60s, uh, this was, you know, people call it the first television war, and it was the first television war in Japan as well as in the U.S. Japan, of course, was just coming out of having been bombed heavily during World War II. So when they saw kind of all the heavy bombings in Vietnam, a lot of the people were kind of very sympathetic to the Vietnamese side of it, even though the Japanese government was officially allied with the U.S. So Prime Minister Sato, who was a Prime Minister for mo much of the 1960s, uh, at one point he was going to go on a trip to South Vietnam, to kind of Saigon, to kind of support the U.S war effort or support the Saigon government. Uh, and the students rioted and they, they burned cars on the highway to try and stop them from, from getting to South Vietnam. But he, uh, they weren't actually successful in stopping the trip. Uh, also, um, the anti-nuclear thing was a big thing in Japan. You know, the, uh, of course, they, they were hit by the nuclear bomb. Uh, and they, they're, they did not want any nuclear weapons on Japanese soil. Uh, and because the U.S. government had a lot of military bases on Japan, and because the U.S. government would not allow Japan to inspect it to make sure there were no nuclear weapons, that was kind of a big concern. And then it was 67 or 68, uh, a ship called the USS Enterprise docked in Japan which was, I forget, either carrying nuclear weapons or was suspected of carrying nuclear weapons. Or maybe it was nuclear-powered. Uh, I don't remember. There was something to do with nuclear. 
and the students were not happy about this. So there were big kind of uh, riots and student protests around this. But what also was happening at the end of the 60s was there was this global student movement, you know, 1968, right? So there were protests in Chicago, and there were protests in Mexico City, and there were protests in Paris, and there were protests in Prague, and kind of all over the world. And people could see this on TV, and so this had an effect of kind of spreading the this air of protest kind of around the world. And so I think that's that was a major factor in kind of the second wave of student protests in Japan in the late 60s was not only kind of the Vietnam War and Japan's involvement in it, but just this kind of era of student protests that was kind of around the world at the time. So in 1967 and 68 and 69, there were massive protests at I think all Japanese major universities to the point where most of them actually got shut down for a year or more. Kind of the, the students kind of barricaded uh, the universities. They uh, chased the professors off. They said, we're not going to have exams. Uh, I said, sorry, I, I know I said I wasn't going to get into reminiscence about this, but I'm going to break my rule here just a second. This is something that the Japanese people I talked to, the older people, remember well. Some of them who are apolitical just kind of remember not having to turn up for exams. They say, well, I turned up for my exam and the university had been shut down for student protests, so I didn't get to take my exam that year. Uh, sorry, they don't say it like that. They said, I, I got to skip my exam this year. Like, I think they just, everyone just passed because nobody could take their exams. Some of them who are kind of part of this to a certain degree or another, remember it as kind of a very magical time. They said, we, we took control of the campus and for one year there were no professors or teachers and they said, we taught each other. So they would have like teach-ins where the students would kind of teach each other about politics and stuff like that. And they had, they had completely, for that year, finished with the exam system. So this, this was one of the at this point, the impression I get, and I think this was true of the U.S. student protest as well, um, people kind of forgot about the Vietnam War to a certain extent. So the protests weren't even about the Vietnam War. The protests were just about student power and student rights. And in Japan, they protest against tuition fees and they protested against exams and I don't know, they, they protested against the professors or they, they didn't like the education system in the university. They didn't like the exams, they didn't like the tuition. So they were, they were protesting against this. Uh, and yeah, kind of took over the universities for a year or a little bit longer than a year. Uh, the most famous part was uh, Tokyo University. Um, I, I think in part because Tokyo University is the most famous university in Japan. And if you've never lived in Japan, Tokyo University is like, how to describe it? Tokyo University, I don't think, it's like Harvard or Yale in the, U, in the US, except maybe times 100. It's like the university that everybody wants to get into. And if you can get into Tokyo University, your future is guaranteed for life. It's just so notorious in Japan for being so hard to get into and only taking the cream of the crop. Uh, and like, you know, if you're in Japan and you meet somebody who'd ever been to Tokyo University, you're like, wow, you got into Tokyo University. It was just like, Tokyo University was kind of uh, not exempt from this. There was, uh, the students took over this famous clock tower and there was television footage of the police kind of battling the students. The police were shooting water cannons up at the students. The students are, are um, shooting slingshots back at the police. I read in one book, I don't know if this is hyperbole, maybe it is, but I read it in a book. They said, even though nobody was killed in this, they said this was the Japanese equivalent of Kent State. Just because Tokyo University students are put up on such a pedestal and to see the police kind of come in and crack their heads, 
was just kind of so horrifying or shocking to the Japanese people, even though nobody, nobody got killed, but just kind of to see this happen at Tokyo University. Sorry, anecdotally, just in Japan when I was there, this is one of those images that would always be on TV whenever anyone was talking about the Showa period or the 1960s. It was one of those kind of iconic images. You'd always see the Yasuda bell tower fight between the students and the police. Um, the other, yeah, so there, there were all these student protests going on. Um, there was also a lot of middle class protests against the Vietnam War, you know, kind of like mothers marching against the Vietnam War, that kind of thing. And I think maybe this happened in the U.S. as well, kind of as the student protests got more and more extreme, they kind of diverged to the extent where like the student protests were no longer even concerned about the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War protests were at this point kind of mostly middle class Japanese people. There was a, there was a group called Beihei Ren, which uh, uh, in Japanese means Peace in Vietnam Committee, or um, it's an abbreviation for Peace in Vietnam Committee in, in Japanese. It was started by a famous novelist. I, I wrote his name down. Makato Oda. I, I had to write his name down, but he is one of those novelists you hear a lot in Japan. Uh, they, they're most, they were kind of, they were, they were like the new left. They were decentralized. They were kind of, uh, visible leaders were discouraged, kind of that kind of thing, but they weren't really, uh, involved in kind of these university things. I don't think, I don't know. Maybe I'm getting that wrong. Beihei Ren was kind of most, they had a lot of Vietnam War protests, but I guess they're most notorious for kind of helping Americans desert, right? Because there are Americans on the military bases in Japan who were going to get shipped to Vietnam, and some of them didn't want to get shipped to Vietnam. So the Beihei Ren would kind of smuggle some of them out, and they kind of hide them in Japan, and then they get shipped up to Russia. I think there were three three American military people who Beihei Ren had kind of smuggled out of Japan and then they ended up kind of in Sweden and Sweden gave them safe, pay, safe uh, haven. They couldn't get safe haven in Japan because the Japanese government was, a, was allied with the U.S. Um, yeah, the other thing that started to happen around this time was factionalization and this was, this is where it gets a little bit odd. But the students started to form factions uh, based upon kind of, you know, I guess leftists are notorious for kind of splitting off into factions in general. But it just went a little bit crazy in Japan where there were all these different factions of different leftist groups. Uh, and it got to the point, once they had cleared the police out of the universities, they started fighting each other. Uh, and they spent more time fighting each other than they kind of spent fighting the police after the police had been cleared out of the universities. And you can see video of this if you watch some of the archival footage. So, and it's so bizarre because like, if, you ever, if you've ever seen sports day at a Japanese uh, primary school, you know, the one team has the red hats and one team has the white hats and they compete in these sports. It's the same thing like they had like the white helmets and the blue helmets and the red helmets. They, they, they had colored helmets uh, um, based on what faction they were in. And there were casualties. I mean, students got killed in these kind of internecine uh, fights just between different leftist factions of students. Uh, it just got a bit bizarre. Um, now within that, out of that, uh, kind of in the late 60s, 70s, came a group called the Japanese Red Army. And I hate to talk about the Japanese Red Army too much because I don't want to give them too much prominence because you... I mean, I think the focus should be more on kind of the ordinary students and not these kind of extremists who are only like a handful of people. I think, you know, there is only like, I don't know, 20 of them or something like that. But it is these extremists that kind of take up, that, you know, kind of catch all the attention. So um, 
they, they, they came out of this factional infighting between uh, different Japanese student groups. Uh, and then they, they split up into a couple different, I don't know what you would call them, cadres, where there was a, a, group of, uh, a group of them went abroad and a group of them stayed in Japan. The group of them that stayed in Japan uh, had this really bizarre story where they, they were hiding out in the mountains and they were up in this, in this mountain retreat and they went through this uh, bizarre purity thing where they, were, they were, would have like self-criticism meetings every night and kind of talk about people's faults. And, you know, it was kind of the, the classic kind of Maoist self-criticism thing where people were encouraged to kind of talk about how they had failed the group. Uh, and then they ended up, the, 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 the people who were viewed as not being ideologically pure enough were just kind of beaten and then tied up and kind of left to freeze. I don't think they were killed intentionally, but they were kind of killed by neglect. Uh, there's a fascinating book on all this, which I read years ago. It's out of print, but you can find it in interlibrary loan or Amazon or something like that. Blood and Rage, the story of the Japanese Red Army by William Farrell. Uh, if, you, if you ever come across this book, I found this absolutely fascinating. Uh, and after they had kind of gone through this thing where they had killed off half of their own members, uh, they ended up taking over this, this resort lodge, like the ski, I, was it a ski lodge or something? I don't know, in the mountains. And then the police, after they had taken it over and kind of barricaded it and put all their guns, the police came in to get them and there was a standoff between them and the police. And what makes this, I guess, this is one of those things where the television cameras were just all right there. So kind of any Japanese person who was alive during the 70s remembers this very well because this was on TV the whole time. And it continues to be, at least when I was in Japan, one of those iconic clips, you know, when they're showing clips from like, oh, remember the 1970s? These clips always get shown of like the, because the, the police brought in a crane with like a wrecking ball uh, to kind of demolish the lodge and get these students out and you can kind of see this clip of the the crane and the wrecking ball um, so yeah that's a rather bizarre story but because all the television cameras were right on during that time it's just kind of one of those iconic moments the the at least when I was in Japan the Japanese film industry had done multiple movies about this um, even though like the yeah, I said earlier that the student movement was kind of largely forgotten by the young people. But this is kind of the exception, I think. People still remember this bizarre incident with the Japanese Red Army. So that was inside Japan. Outside of Japan, uh, I think as the Vietnam War was winding down, the Japanese Red Army kind of decided that the Palestinian liberation was going to be kind of their main cause instead. I think this was true of a lot of leftist groups at the time. Uh, maybe not American leftist groups, but I think a lot of the leftist groups in Germany uh, and maybe France, I don't know, also got involved in this cause. So they were, they were involved in an there was a network of kind of leftists or Palestinian terrorists in Europe in the 1970s. So you had groups like, I forget the names of these groups now, Black September was at it, uh, and Carlos Sajakal, the infamous guy, and the Japanese Red Army were part of that network, kind of operating out of Paris. I'm out of time again. Uh, that's all right. Uh, I'm just going to stop it here. If you're interested in finding out more about the Japanese Ar Red Army or the Japanese student movement, just search Google. There's a lot more stuff on there now than there was 20 years ago.